Dr. Jessica Coring is an orthopedic surgeon from Spokane, Washington, and uh, she is a recent uh, arrival on the scene. She has, uh, did a residency at the University of Utah, and she did a, a foot and ankle fellowship in Rochester, New York. She's also academically published, as I said earlier, in JBJS on kind of looking at how the transference of residency skills uh, translates into real life practice. Um, so she's actually published several landmark articles on this. So she's very knowledgeable about this. And us as older surgeons who were educated pre um, uh, work hour restrictions kind of always feel, oh, wow, how's the new generation going to be? Who's going to operate on my knee? So Jessica, reflect to us what your experiences have been in real life, uh, joining a busy private practice in Spokane, Washington from this uh, very erudite educational background. But thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much for that excellent introduction, Dr. Chapman. It's an honor to be presenting tonight. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Let me bring up my talk here. There we go, perfect. So, um, so yes, I am a year and a half into practice with Northwest Orthopedic Specialists here in Spokane. And so I was given the opportunity to talk a little bit about some research I did in residency and kind of reflect back on my last year and a half and what I didn't quite realize or learn in training. Um, so no disclosures. So again, um, September 2019 is when I started practice and that's my background. Uh, just a brief outline of starting to talk a little bit about just a brief overview of my research um, and then talk a little bit about the role of mentorship and then unknown challenges that I encountered early on in practice. Um, so starting out, so what should I have expected? And this kind of goes to um, this longitudinal research project that I did with several of my mentors at Utah that culminated into my uh, chief year graduation presentation. And so in our first study, we looked at um, case volumes done in residency. So we took a group of, um, we looked at the case logs that uh, where you record your case volume for your five years in residency training. And we looked at those surgeons and then actually compared their numbers that they did in residency to their six month board collection period. So we compared the same group of surgeons in our first study and looked at the top procedure performed and um, trying to kind of answer these, these questions of where are the discrepancies in training versus early practice and what our new surgeons may be not necessarily quite prepared for. And so then this kind of jumps to, well, does this even really matter? I did a fellowship. I'm just going to be doing cases that I do in my subspecialty training. As we know, and this is an older paper, but uh, in, as of 2013, 90% of residents were doing a fellowship training, and that's probably closer to 95% at this point. Um, so if we break down the numbers, if you look at the top five procedures done in residency, the top two are total knee and total hips, followed by sports, harder removal, of course, and then kind of lower down on the list is treatment of proximal femur fractures. And so in the parentheses, you've got the relative rates of the comparison of cases done in training versus early practice. And so, for example, a total knee, for total knee procedures, you do twice as many in training as um, these surgeons did in early practice. And if we go again down to proximal femur fractures, you're seeing about half that volume in residency versus what's being done in early practice. So I highlighted that as kind of a major discrepancy there. And then again, top five procedures, some similarities there, um, but again, kind of those as we kind of get into the meat of it, more of these trauma procedures, we're probably not quite getting the volume that we should be in residency. And so again, kind of in summary, we do a lot of joints, but not a lot of hip fractures uh, that these early that early surgeons are seeing in practice as we take lots of call. Um, and then as far as similarities go, a lot of overlap with knee scope procedures, meniscectomies, ACL reconstructions, shoulder scopes, and subacromial decompressions, rotator cuff repairs. So pretty much those relative rates in residency versus early practice were around one for these types of procedures. And so the next question we attempted to answer is, well, okay, so we know these common procedures, how many cases do I need to do in training to be ready to go? And so in our second study, we 
asked uh, early, or early practice surgeons, so surgeons um, sitting for part two of their oral boards, sent out a survey and asked them, these are the top 25 procedures done in early practice. How many repetitions do residents need to do in order to be proficient? And so, for example, um, for the bimalleolar ankle fracture, which was in the top 25 procedures performed in early practice, uh, young sur or surgeons early on in practice were saying we need to do 30 of them in training to be ready to go. Program directors were pretty similar, a little bit lower, and we see that the median resident experience based on our research from study number one was below that benchmark by almost half. Um, and then if we kind of broke down the, the deficiency procedures of where there was lower volumes, again, it's trauma, which continues to kind of be a theme throughout all of this, where, um, you know, hip fractures, femur fractures, dysarrhagias fractures, ankle fractures that we see and do a lot in early practice, we're not quite seeing the volumes that we should be probably in training. Um, so I asked myself, well, did I believe my own research? And so I came out of my foot and ankle fellowship, hoping I'd have a nice fancy foot and ankle practice of flat foot reconstructions and sports and forefoot procedures and total ankles. And as I looked at my numbers, yeah, I did a lot of foot and ankle trauma, but I also did a lot of hip fractures, um, which ended up being about 10 to 12% of my practice early on when I broke down my numbers. And so again, I kind of fell into that, that mold and of, of this is what we do early on in practice. Um, and then for our final study, we asked my actual group of graduating residents um, uh, a survey about the top 25 procedures that you're gonna see and do in early practice. And do you feel independent in doing these procedures? And for these commonly performed procedures that we see here, 90 plus percent of graduating residents felt ready to go. So although a lot of us were going on to fellowship training, at the end of residency training, at least felt that in in, in these types of cases, the majority of people uh, of graduating residents felt ready to go um, once they hit uh, real life. Um, and so again, kind of like what I talked about, I've, I've, I have, you know, my elective practice, it's picking up, things were a little weird with COVID hitting six months into practice. Um, but truly my, my early, my first year and a half has been a lot of trauma. And so my argument kind of as I concluded after reviewing or putting together these three studies is, you know, at the end of the day, practice does make perfect. And my kind of uh, end statement was we probably should restructure residency where chief year um, you're not, you know, you'll get your fellowship training, so you'll do your subspecialty training, but we should probably focus on these common procedures and make sure that residents are hitting those repetitions and maybe getting out into the community with community surgeons since 80% of us plus go out uh, into community medicine. And so as I kind of switch gears a little bit, so now that I'm in practice, well, how did I find support some, for some of these tougher cases or cases where I didn't quite feel like I had the 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 experience or repetitions um, to do and and recently there's been more and more coming out and this was a nice article out of the yellow journal talking about mentorship and again their statement of traditional clinical training may be insufficient is you know somewhat highlighted in our in our research and um, not only do we need as young surgeons support in the operating room but coming out of an academic center, we have no idea how to run a private practice or how things work getting out there on our own. And so learning the business side of things, how to structure a clinic, um, deal with diff difficult patient outcomes, things like that. I've really learned to lean on my, my senior partners. And so this was a fun case John Keeve and I did. So it was intertroch fracture with a long stem knee prosthesis. And so in the OR, he showed me how, uh, how to use a diamond burr tip to on the Midas Rex to cut off the end of a femoral nail, which was, you know, something I had never done before. Um, and then um, Mike McDonald, another one of my partners, helped me out with this paraprosthetic femur fracture. It had been about two years since I had done one of those since residency. And, and then obviously some tougher foot and ankle cases, a calcaneus malunion. Uh, Brian P Patterte was gracious enough to join me in the OR for this case. And so, um, you know, the role of mentorship is super important. Even if we do hit those numbers in residency, I think real life stresses and um, you being the person taking care of that patient, it's, it's really um, a uh, helpful feeling knowing that you've got 
you've got backup. And so in our group, I started with two other surgeons and we've kind of started the the discussion of maybe making this more of a formal program um, to kind of learn how things work in real you know, in real practice, as well as have that senior mentorship avail- available to us without being too nervous to ask for help um, or seeing it as a sign of weakness. Um, and finally, to kind of end things, um, you know, coming out of residency and fellowship, they talk about the three A's. Well, added on adaptability, partially because I was six months into practice when COVID started. And also for me, being a foot and ankle surgeon, I've had this unique experience um, in my special subspecialty of dealing with podiatrists. Um, there's a lot out in the community. And this was something else that, you know, in academic medicine, you're kind of sheltered from um, podiatry. They're not in the academic hospitals. And, and being in a community area, I've seen a lot of complications and um, kind of learning how to navigate that other difficult aspect, uh, being a foot and ankle surgeon and aligned with um, this really tough case. This was a really nice 55 year old woman who had straightforward ankle arthritis for some reason, but I just thought it would be a good idea to do a hind foot nail. She came to me after being infected probably for about eight months. And so she got two rounds of IV antibiotics and two antibiotic nails before we feel pretty good. I think that her infections clear for, for limb salvage. And so lots of adventures and challenges and exciting times in my first year and a half, but, uh, it's a uh, it's an exciting Spokane's been awesome. Um, Northwest Ortho has been a wonderful place to start practice, and I just look forward to my my journey ahead. And so, uh, thank you all for your time and and listening, and I appreciate this opportunity.